But welcome everybody who's, who's come along to the uh, Women of the World Festival and to this special uh, Women in Faith session. And I think we've got a sparkling panel here, um, which we'll be listening to in a minute. And of course, all of you who all have your own uh, stories and ideas and uh, suggestions and thoughts, which um, I'm hoping we'll be able to hear as many as possible. Um, we have been um, put together partly by the Women's Interfaith Network, and I'm looking for, is it Angela? Would you raise your hand, Angela? The Women's Interfaith Network, um, if you want to know anything a little bit more about that, please ask, ask, ask Angela. But Women's Interfaith Network um, came about after 9-11. Gilda Levy and Le Pinky Lilani got together and thought, how can women um, help bring women, women from different faith traditions together? And, uh, and now has... Um, local groups right throughout London, I think, and the South East, and does a huge amount. And we'll be hearing a little bit about their work at Holloway Prison. And there's going to be a great um, art exhibition um, for and the Oxo Tower Gallery, um, I think, next month, 20th to 30th of April. Look out for that. March. 23rd is March. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, my name is Katrina Robertson and I convene the London Boroughs Faith Network. I'm, uh, I'm hail from Scotland, from Scottish Highlands, so I was brought up within the Church of Scotland. So a combination of sort of earthy um, Celtic spirituality and the Church of Scotland. And I just checked this morning on the, on the internet, the Church of Scotland actually um, um, uh, ordained women ministers. Um, a couple of years before s the Swiss government, or s Switzerland, allowed women the vote. So I'm a little bit proud about that. Um, I've lived, travelled, worked abroad, and the last couple of decades lived in London. So I'm really a Londoner now, and, and an Anglican. And I'm sure um, when Sally perhaps uh, speaks to us, we'll hear about uh, women in the, in the Church of England and her experiences there. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty much of a grassroots person, um, working with um, local churches, mosques, temples, synagogues, um, and very much see grassroots people, and particularly women, um, as part of the solution, um, not just to be seen as, as, as problems, and problematising women and problematising um, religion, and not, doesn't sit very happily with me. But um, I will introduce our panel. Um, in turn, and they were going to say a few words about themselves, their work, um, and then we're going to have a bit of a discussion um, amongst ourselves on the topics that are on on the programme here, and and then then we're going to open it out so that as many of you are able to to share your experiences, your expertise, your ideas about about women and faith. So um, let's start with. Sophia and Huda, um, who, when I first saw the, the magazine that they produce, it's, it's O-O-M-K, and I thought, you're never going to be able to pronounce that, but they do, they pronounce it oomk. Um, <laughs> and um, Sophia has, has, uh, is a magazine editor um, of oomk and other things, and an illustrator, and has put together a fantastic a magazine about um, about headscarves, which is absolutely hilarious. Anybody who thinks that satire is, is on the way out, do have a look at this um, magazine, which might be seeing up on the screens at the moment. It's a biannual publication about women, faith, and creativity, and she also <coughs> co-organises the popular DIY Cultures Festival, based in East London. Um, and Huda, at the end here. Um, is a contributor to, and an events coordinator for UMPC. Um, and her interests also include Islamic law and practice, as well as third world approaches to international law. And I notice on her Twitter feed, she describes herself as creating dangerously. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got some, some dangerous women <laughs> and some very creative women at, uh, to, to start us off. Sophia. Yep. Um, well, my name is Sophia, and um, I'm the editor of a magazine called Imp, which stands for One of My Kind. Um, it's a biannual publication that I founded with two of my friends, and we wanted to make a magazine 
that was um, about women and spirituality and creativity, but we wanted to do it away from the mainstream narratives of Muslim women, which are often very negative. And, um, you know, they're always pitted against this type of normal woman or this universal woman that Muslim women don't seem to um, match up to. Um, negative spaces like we talked about you know the, the discussions about niqab, hijab, there's like certain topics that Muslim women are allowed to talk about or are allowed to um, be seen in relation to. So we wanted to create a space where we could just talk to each other and um, the magazine's not just a, just for Muslim women, it's, it's open to any woman but we're especially encouraging of um, contributions from Muslim women. And I am Muslim and I would say that religion, um, especially my religion, Islam, has an overwhelmingly positive effect on, on my life. Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, so um, I'm too from Unk, and uh, I just want to start first. Is anyone here from South London? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, so am I. I'm, I'm from Lambeth. Sort of the South Bank is a particularly special area for me because it's sort of the beginning of the borough and it's a place that I've always sort of had school trips to and so I, I love this as a space as to have these kind of forums. It's this open space where people from across Britain, not just people from South London, can enjoy. Um, I also wanted to ask: Is anyone Muslim here? Yay! So great because I really, again, I think this panel is a is a discussion panel, hopefully, and we we're, we're sort of up here and. First, we want to make a disclaimer that we're not scholars, we're not uh, people here who are going to talk about sort of a historiography of Islam. We're, we're here as, as believing women, as women of faith, uh, of the Muslim faith, and we really want to hear other people's discussions and hear other Muslim perspectives. So that's really sort of caveated first, and I want this to be sort of really, I, I hope this is going to be a really interactive with panel discussion, not only between us up here, but also with everyone, you know, looking at us here. Um, it's a little bit scary. Um, yeah, so... Um, <laughs> So like we said, UMC is this space where we really wanted women, specifically Muslim women, to share our art, to share our creativity and create spaces that we can um, contribute. Um, and um, I really, I think as a woman of faith and as a Muslim woman, you know, we, we are problematized. I, I feel we are problematized and we are sort of, again, as Sophie said, sort of framed in these negative spaces. But my experience of being a woman and being a woman of faith has been um, my, my gender, my, my womanness and my faith are so intricately linked. My, I learned Islam from my mother. I went to Quran school or in Somali Duxi and I was taught by women. Um, me and Sophie actually met in Damascus in 2008. We were both studying Quran and um, Islamic law in this sort of these women's spaces, these women's seminaries. And we were around all these amazing women who taught us about our faith and were living their lives. And that's, that's how we've always internalized our, our religion. Um, and I think as, as believing women, our worldview is sort of, and I know this, it's, it's, I try to center it on God. And that's how my relationship with the world is. It's a sort of it starts with God. So I sort of want to finish my introduction with um, an ayah from the Quran, um, Surah Al-Hujarat, which is um, Surah 49. By 13, I think it kind of really just helps you, helps us hopefully sort of start with the base that we can understand each other um, and understand our sort of cosmology and what we're about and what we're about and kind of perspective we want to have. So um, it says, O mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female and from different tribes so that may you, you may know each other and, and love each other. Indeed, the most noble amongst you in the sight of God is the most righteous amongst you. And indeed, God is all-knowing and acquainted with what you do. And so, UMC has a project, and, and I hope like this, this panel as well is like this space where we can know each other and love each other and understand that that's where we're coming from, this space of love, and we're created from love, and we're created from a loving God. Um, and if for, those, for those of us who, who don't have a faith as well, it's a really a time for us to, you know, to understand where our perspectives are. So, um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And we must talk more about Damascus. I didn't know you've been there. That's great. And I think you've, you've just quoted um, one of my uh, most favourite um, passages from the Holy Quran, and mm -hmm. that lovely. We made you. We intentionally made you different, so that you could know each other. So this is what we're, what we're hoping to do here today: is to, to know each other. Way that we come from a religious tradition or, or no religious tradition. Sally. <coughs> 
when you're saying none of us are scholars, I'm certainly not a scholar, <laughs> and we can all speak for ourselves. But I think probably Sally <laughs> is a scholar, because <laughs> um, she's been through a great deal of theological training, and is an Anglican priest, and is the largest multi-faith university chaplaincy in Europe at Brunel, Brunel University. And so it's a lot to do with young people, um, uh, young women and young men. She's an award-winning activist for feminism and women bishops in the Church of England and against homophobia within faith. She's been recognised down the years for her work as a community organiser and is a keen advocate for the use of social media. And I think we should all give out our Twitter handles at the end so that we can all, all of us keep in touch with each other afterwards. And Sally's a, a prolific uh, Twitterer. Um, Sally is a regular news reviewer on BBC Breakfast and a commentator on a variety of national television and radio news programmes. Um, and she's also, she told me last night, was ringing everybody last night saying, definitely coming, you're going to be here, yes, um, that she was, um, as, as part of the campaign for women bishops within the Church of England, um, was, took part in a fashion shoot that went on the front page of the Times uh, newspaper, and with a rejoinder from the Daily Mail um, saying, uh, <laughs> too fashionable to be a priest, was that what they said? So... Um, <laughs> So it's funny to think fashion and women and religion, they don't, they don't go together somehow. But um, anyway, that's, that's the Daily Mail's um, opinion. But luckily we've got Sally here to speak for herself and we look forward to what you have to say. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I guess like many women of faith, uh, my faith was primarily influenced by my mum. Uh, my mum uh, is, has a very uh, non-organised version of faith. Uh, she's very involved in her local community, always has been. She trained as a midwife and as a nurse. If anyone's seen Call the Midwife, that's where she trained. But 10 years later, she'd want me to add because she's not that old. <laughs> uh, and, but really, I grew up with this amazing role model of someone who had a great deal of compassion for other people. And, and her faith was part of that, even if she wasn't always part of the church. Um, and this motivated her to try and care. And compassion was her main focus in why she cared and in her decision making in terms of her involvement with her local community. So I learned most about being a priest really from my mum. Um, and I grew up in a rather conservative uh, church setting. When I was 12, I was uh, singing a hymn in church and I suddenly realized I didn't mean a word I was saying and uh, decided to work it out myself. So I was quite an intense little 12 year old. I got hold of the New Testament and, and read it all through and suddenly it came alive and suddenly I found characters in there that were like me. In particular, the, the, uh, the, the character of Mary, the, the mother of Jesus. Suddenly I realized that she wasn't some stuffy old man. She was someone who was about my age and was female and I could relate to her. And she was talking about God and she was passionate and she was fearless. And that sense of finding a role model meant so much to me that I, I went into school and I I convinced all my little school friends to stay in at lunch break and do a little Bible study. <laughs> and that maybe was the start of my future career uh, in uh, theology and in the church. Um, I went and studied anthropology and learned about how many different perspectives on God that there are and how actually there's no one different, one view that, that can claim to own God, but actually we can all claim to be trying to pursue the God that we know and, and trying to work towards that. And I stayed within the evangelical, quite conservative parts of Christianity, not believing that ha we could have women leaders and women preachers. And, and then I went to working with girls in boarding schools all over the UK and saw uh, how much good you, uh, boarding school chaplains could do. And so I decided to look into ordination because of that, but still not convinced I was going to ever be a vicar or a priest. And it was only really halfway through my training that I finally gave in and realized that the New Testament, I think, um, doesn't actually prohibit women from getting involved in leading and preaching, but actually is promoting women to study, is promoting this, this concept that women have a voice within the church and actually something valuable to say about God who is neither male nor female, or is both male and female, and much, much more. I went and re-studied uh, theology at Oxford and uh, found there just uh, that all the books in the library, almost all the books in the library were written by men. Um, and it was something that was quite disheartening when I looked around and saw so many male voices about the God I got to know through my mum and through reading the New Testament and hearing women's voices like Mary's in the New Testament were all put through this filter of men uh, writing about it. Apart from prayer and maybe a little bit on pastoral care and the very notable exceptions, there aren't many voices of women within academic theology and I think that's a reflection of academia in general rather than just theology. 
Um, and then I became a, uh, well, I, I majored my study on the study of diversity. And in particular, that, that as Christians, if we worship a God who is three in one, we should be happy with diversity. We're not all trying to become one. There should be this idea that, that diversity is important um, and many different voices are needed for us to understand God. Um, and then I went and worked as a chaplain in Oxford for a year, and then I worked in Ealing uh, when, I don't know if you remember the Ealing riots and the riots that spread all across London. Um, I was very, I like to say, I was very involved in the Ealing riots. What I mean is, <laughs> um, I, it, they, I was involved in the clear up um, of Ealing riots when using Twitter and, and Facebook to try and enable the whole community to, to respond to that. And really through that experience, I saw again how God could be present outside the church walls, that God could be motivating people towards good and working together, even with different perspectives and, and for the good of the whole community. Now I'm, I'm a, a chaplain uh, in, in, the, in uh, a large university in London. We are the 14th most uh, international university in the world. And I, I lead a large multi-faith team there with uh, 10 chaplains and four interns. So I'm kept busy. But one of the things I try and do still is focus on this diversity issue. I'm about to launch a YouTube channel called Diverse Church, which is uh, starting with uh, things like a, a, an It Gets Better film for, for LGBT Christians, uh, to young LGBT Christians to get their voices and their experiences out there. But we're also looking at things like disability within the church, race, um, and of course gender. Um, within that and uh, one of the things I'm most passionate about is the is the striving for women bishops within the Church of England now fingers crossed we will get them in July and uh, as everyone seems to be saying that this is something we are finally going to be able to see come into place and my lifetime has spanned from where I was born for the first 15 years of my life where women were not allowed to become priests to now where I'm a little bit older than 15, and we will see women bishops. And I believe that within my lifetime we'll have the first woman Archbishop of Canterbury. But we're still faced with issues on, on, the, more general, um, on the more general sphere. What do we do with women and maternity leave when women priests want to stop and have children? How do we deal with the fact that the vast majority of women who are getting ordained are still in their 50s, not in their 20s and 30s? How do we empower young women to find a voice within academic theology and faith? And then more broadly within the Christian church, the Church of England is quite an unusual um, pocket within the Christian church in that we do have women priests and that we do have women doing more than childcare and coffee making and flower arranging. Um, I think it's something that we need to have an increased dialogue among the Christian traditions and the Catholic church and the Orthodox church and the Pentecostal churches because we all have different experiences of women's ministry and to be able to share those experiences and move forward together is something I'm quite passionate about. So I'm very happy to be here um, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. <laughs> Thank you Sally. And, uh, and when you mentioned the riots, of course we, we have a that we have the institution, the religious institutions, but we've also got religion, the church, in my case, as a movement of people over the centuries who've been very active and done things. And the institution being, um, being human creations always have difficulties, um, but that's not, it's not the whole picture, and um, it's good, it's good to, to, to draw attention to that. Um, when you mentioned um, academia, um, I keep a tally on Twitter as to how many um, women and men are on panels such as this, and this is probably the only panel I've ever been on where we've all been women. But actually, the, in, in my multi-faith world, where lots of religious and non-religious people together, um, we don't do any worse than, than academic panels. Mm -hmm. Um, NGO panels, political panels. Um, so we're not doing any worse, but um, it'd be nice if we could do better. Polly. <laughs> um, Polly set up the Sharan project, and I think she's got lots of leaflets if you, if you need one a bit later, um, which it provides support and advice to women, particularly from South Asian back backgrounds, who are unable to remain within their family environment for reasons other than, but not excluding, domestic violence or forced marriages. So it's that sort of in-between space for women who need a bit of support and help if they've left their family or need to leave their family um, and, uh, and make, make a life for themselves without having to um, leave their whole identity behind. And. Um, Probably you'll be able to tell us a little bit more about that and also about the winds. Um. Absolutely. 
Okay, well, thank you for having me here today. Um, when I was asked to speak about women and faith, I thought the best way perhaps for me to illustrate that is through some of the work that we've done. Um, and I am also an advisory board member of the Women's Interfaith Network. Um, and a few years ago, we went into Holloway Prison and we delivered a six week um, program. And what we did was we went in with very little or very low expectations about what we wanted to achieve at the end of it, um, other than bringing women from different faiths together to understand the commonalities we share as women and celebrate the differences in our faiths. And so as a result of a combination of creative writing, um, networking and bringing women who, bringing a Muslim woman and a Jewish woman together in prayer for the first time, asking those awkward questions about each other's cultures and faiths in order to better understand it. By the time we left, we actually had women of all faiths and those of no faith um, coming together um, for the first time and in many cases creating or setting up prayer groups amongst themselves even after we had left. And what that showed us is the, the, the strength and the power of women can, who do come together and the respect that we all have or should have for the differences in our faith. The other project is that, as, as um, Katrina just explained, I founded a charity called The Sharon Project and it's largely for women who've been disowned by their families. So we help to provide support towards independent living. Now, one of the projects that we're working on at the moment, which was launched at the Foreign Office this week, is called Harnessing Change. In light of the forthcoming Forced Marriage Act that will be coming into act in about two months' time, we wanted to bring together ambassadors and partners to advocate for consent in marriage. Um, and the way we've been doing that is by getting community leaders, religious leaders, school teachers, but also you know, high profile sector leaders to come together and say, I challenge forced marriage and this is why. We think it's really important that women, and when it comes to women and faith, that we recognize that there is a disadvantage or an inequality, that if there's something we can do to address that, then that's what we should do. Now, in my work, particularly through the Sharon Project, I meet many women who have faced the most abhorrent and the most sort of indefensible acts of abuse, yet they continue to hold on to their faith. Um, that, and it, in some ways, it is in part that faith that has somehow led to them being subjugated in being abused. And I wonder why they still hold on to this, if it is such a bad thing. And I'm not going to pretend to have all the answers, but one thing that I sort of realise is that maybe it's because women are more than just their faith. They are strong, independent women. They are resilient and they're adaptable. And more importantly, they are the future as individuals. And for me, in the work that I do, whether, regardless of faith or, or religion, Women need to be nurtured and not abused. They need to be supported and not pushed to the side. And they need to be recognised as the change makers and role models of the future. So I'm really looking forward to this debate, not just so that I can share my views, but also to hear from you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. And I think in a very marketised world where we tend to be measured by how much we earn or what we do at work, and it's always good to remember that there's a whole other world out there that's incredibly important um, at home and uh, about values and raising children and a lot more. Thank you, Polly. Uh, Dina has, it says here, four sons. <laughs> um, Dina, Dina Braw was uh, born in Milan and uh, raised in an Orthodox Jewish family. She pursued her religious studies in Jerusalem and New York and obtained a BA and an ME from the University of London. So I think we'll have, are you a self-identified scholar, Polly? Yeah. A scholar? Okay, no scholar, no scholar, definitely scholar. No scholar, no scholar. But I'm a scholar. A scholar, maybe, <laughs> but not really a scholar. <laughs> Somebody who knows her stuff, anyway. Um, developed an interest in Jewish Orthodox feminism over the last decade and her current role is, in her current role as Jofa UK ambassador, she's initiated a feminist movement within Orthodox Judaism, and that might be you know, news to, 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 to some of us to think, oh, what? How, how does that work? 
um, as a mother of four sons, she's concerned about their exposure to gender stereotyping in the media, and she's keen to counter this by enabling them to see society through women's eyes. And I think you also, um, apart from bringing up your, your children and um, it being very involved in Jofa, um, you are, uh, do you deliver training at Jewish Care, which is a huge organisation across, um, across Europe. So, Dina. So thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to be taking part in WOW, um, having watched the fe festival last year. It's really exciting to be here. Um, so yeah, I am from Italy. I was raised in Italy as an Orthodox Jew. Um, when my husband and I met, my husband was a chaplain in a prison in the States. He is an Orthodox rabbi. And the other chaplain who was a reverend said, how does that work? You marry an Italian woman. She, you're getting married in the church first, then in the synagogue, he was very confused, and he said, no, no, she's actually Jewish and Orthodox from Italy, and that kind of really um, puzzled him a bit. So there are not that many Orthodox Jews in Italy, but I was, I grew up in a small community, um, in a small Jewish community, which was very mixed, and it was interesting because my parents were from Morocco, um, we were raised in France, so I had quite a mix of backgrounds together, in a sense, and my grandparents occasionally do speak some words of Arabic, so, you know, I have that strange mix to my background. And then as a 15-year-old, I went to study in Israel, and I continued my um, religious education in Israel, and after that in New York. So I was exposed to a varying interpretation of Judaism, even within Orthodoxy, in a sense. <clears throat> And I have to confess, I am only a 10-year-old feminist. Um, what I mean by that is that I discovered feminism only 10 years ago, a decade ago, when I went to an Orthodox feminist um, conference in Jerusalem. The truth is that ra being raised as an Orthodox Jewish woman, I didn't really feel second class or different. Um, and because perhaps within Orthodox Judaism, there's a very well-developed apologetic um, a narrative to explain away the differences between the sexes, the separate but equal narrative, um, why there are you know, some rituals that only men do, some rituals that only women do, and why there are differences within the customs and laws. And what happened um, was that I had always studied a lot of um, Jewish texts, traditions, and so on, understood the meaning of you know, why we did certain things, but I realized that some of how I was educated was to be educated but to remain ignorant in some ways because you know about the traditions, you know about the text, but you don't always understand the development. And um, Jewish education for women is actually only 100 years old, just about to become 100 years old. And so although there are more and more women studying Jewish texts and being Jewishly literate, um, we reali I realized that how they were educated was limited so that they would know how to hold a Jewish family and household together, but wouldn't be able to really question the process of the law and how law develops. And very often it's pre presented as black and white, like it's always been like this. This is straight from, you know, Moses at Sinai. But as you learn, you realize that a lot of our Jewish law developed reflecting social realities and that many of the laws that are there, they were instituted by rabbis in the third and fourth century to protect women, have actually become the same laws that perhaps are right now making a difference to women which are biased towards women and need to be updated. But there is you know, that block where things are not developing anymore. And so this conference a decade ago opened my eyes to some of the issues that are you know, happening in, within Orthodox Judaism, which can be changed, which are not dictated by God directly in a sense. They are really sort of a reflection of how history has developed and how male rabbis have interpreted the law. And there is no reason why we don't change some of it and we don't revisit some of these issues. Um, and this really inspired me. I met lots of interesting and exciting um, women who inspired me. And one of them became a very close friend and a mentor. And about a year ago, she you know, encouraged me to bring back this Orthodox feminist uh, movement to the UK. And so one of my goals is to really think about 
how we view women's participation within the Jewish community. Um, apart from the fact that there aren't enough women in position of lay leadership, um, there isn't enough space for women within the ritual space. Um, and what happens is women have traditionally been exempted from many of the commandments and rituals because their primary um, concern was the family and raising children. Mm -hmm. But things have changed. Women have time for at different points during their lives for other things such as careers, volunteering, and I always say if I can make time for my nails, the gym, volunteering <laughs> for the local um, charities and so on, can I not make time for some ritual participation? So there is definitely a space there, but what happens is that very often women are not knowledgeable enough to ask the right questions of rabbis. Very often they feel they have to ask permission and they don't have that confidence to say, well, we would like to do this. And very often what happens is that if women have knowledge, ask the right question, and the answer is really yes, you can do this, um, they're allowed to do it, but they're not actively invited to do things. That women's participation is not actively invited, it's admitted, it's allowed. And this is something that I'd like to change. I'd like to shift the attitude so that we look at women's uh, potential as something valuable and we try to invite their participation in all the spaces that have to do within faith because um, it's important and valuable and so on, not because we just can't get away with saying no. And as a mother of four sons, I think it's particularly important that my sons, my youngest is here, um, and that they're exposed <laughs> to a counter, I guess a counterbalance to women's image in the media, which is for me very negative. And I'd like my sons um, not to just see women from what they see in the media, but also when they go into the religious space, see women as teachers, leaders, um, people who have something <coughs> of value and contribute, to contribute. Thank you, Dina. And, I, and I, one, of, one of the things that I worry about, um, I come from the sort of hippie um, era of, of um, be, being a woman. And I'm absolutely astonished that nowadays it, it uh, seems to be more and more the case that um, people are more interested in what women look like than in what we say or do or are. And that seems to be something that's changed um, in the wrong direction, certainly since, since I was a young woman. Um, so women in the public space, people, women in, uh, in the, the ritual area of any of our um, traditions um, and in public life generally, um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a signifier, it shows. And of course we're missing out on, on the, you know, half the population's expertise, experience and, and input if we just restrict it, uh, restrict it to men. Now we have a few questions here um, and we had a little chat between, before, before we started and we thought, we looked at the questions and thought, hmm, we might just um, switch them about a little bit and change them a little bit. Um, so we might do that as we go on. The first, the first one um, on the program says, how does faith impact on gender equality? And so there's been, um, <laughs> you probably have something to say about that uh, yourself um, soon. But uh, there's been a lot for that whole festival about uh, gender equality and, and how the, 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 the overt and um, more subtle ways in which um, inequality is, is experienced and shown. Um, but maybe I could uh, come to you, Sophia. Would you like to have... Um, oh, when I first read the question, I thought it was quite interesting that it's framed in a way that it assumes that um, coming from no faith would be less problematic and that if you're coming from faith then you've got more problems and you've got specific problems so um, I don't know I, I always I've always felt like I have less problems <laughs> as a woman of faith I experience less inequality as a woman of faith and if I get treated um, I don't know inequality that I get I feel like it's to do it's not from within the Muslim community, it's in fact from um, outside of the Muslim community and it's from often quite secular forces and um, you know this idea that people who believe in God are a bit stupid, I sometimes feel that and you know if you're, if you're approaching someone and you're approaching them as someone who is less autonomous because they've chosen you know, like almost their religion isn't something that they've chosen, it's something that they're born into, it's something 
Yeah. You know that they. I think especially when you're like vis- visibly like religious or of person of faith, and you sort of you're coming in those spaces. I think yeah, sometimes you can feel a bit. But not to say that to diminish those experiences of women who do feel like within their faith that they. I mean, we're talking again from our own perspective, yeah. and we will sort of develop on that. But yeah, so if, yeah, I mean, so, is that what you feel? So I'm sure everybody's aware of certain like discussions within Islam where um, things are not equal. But coming from where we are, I would say that Islam makes me um, accountable to God, not accountable to man. Um, it makes me accountable for my actions. Um, and um, what else? Yeah, no, I, again, yeah, you just, you just change it because you, the way you see the world, I think. Sort of, first, what is equality? What, what's the, what are the standards that we're thinking about? And you know what are the responsibilities that men and women have against God? That's again, that's that's our parameters, our religion. What's our responsibility to God? Uh, then the lived experience of Muslims or people of faith. Okay, that that's that's another layer that we can dissect. But in terms of as our faith, what our faith asks of us, you know, as people of faith, you know, I I would hope that we wouldn't subscribe. Like I, I feel like our autonomy is questioned. Like we've subscribed to a faith that makes our lives problematic. That says that we're not equal. Mm. That says that we're and, and I, okay. That's something we can discuss and sort of dissect. I hope in the discussions. But thank you. Mm. Thank you. And it's, certainly from from my own scriptures, the uh, the gospels. One of my favourite verses of the truth will set you free. So and the whole liberation theology um, that has be, has been prominent um, the last century and into this. Um, so there's a there's also Polly you mentioned um, that uh, that religion I mean that all the words that have been um, used of course we probably will use them in slightly different ways and I have a problem with the word faith itself and tend to use religion more but um, you were were saying that um, the the women that come to you sometimes it's their it's their religious background that has or the way that's played out has caused the problem but also is a source of strength to them so when we're looking at um, the, uh, the impact that faith has on gender equality, yeah, what I do. As I mentioned before, I don't believe that faith is the cause of inequality. I think it's the interpretation of individuals in order to subjugate women. That is the the, the, the inequality that is faced. Um, when I see women and they're wearing a hijab or a burqa or um, you know going to mosque and, and pray and they tell me w- what's happened to them and yet they hold on to their faith they recognize that it's not the faith itself that caused their situations it was the individuals who misinterpreted for their own own purposes in order to create that and for me then the the, the, the concept of inequality in faith I think are two separate things well the one thing that holds throughout is gender and we know very clearly, and I'm very strong, sort of passionate about feminism, that we haven't quite hit that balance yet. We are being paid less than men. There are more of domestic violence abuse um, cases every year. If this was happening to a man, would we not do something about it? If it was men who were pay- being paid less than women, would we not do something about it? And for me, it's the gender piece that creates the inequality and that's what I think we're all here to say is we all need to do our piece to, to address that mm-hmm. and hopefully the sooner the better. And of course that word intersectionality um, popped up, got it sort of more popularised last year mm-hmm. where you've got um, not just um, uh, gender and uh, religion but uh, disability and um, uh, ethnicity and 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 other uh, sexuality and sexual orientation. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are, it's, it's, com- it's complex. Yeah. And, and for you, that it's, it's being a woman that's the... Um, yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Okay, Dina. Yeah, so I'd like to borrow a little bit like Polly, make a distinction between faith and religion and borrow William James's um, first-hand faith and second-hand faith. So first-hand faith for me would be very much about, you know, God is the creator who's gender neutral, mm-hmm. who um, sees us as, as equal, loves men and women equally in a sense, and that's faith. But what happens with faith, it becomes second-hand when it becomes an institution, an organization, and there are positions of power, and people want to perpetrate that power, and those who hold the position of power very often are men, and perhaps that's where the inequalities come in. Um, 
from my own experience, again, um, the Jewish text, the Jewish um, traditions have evolved over the years and have been interpreted by male rabbis. And so when you look at the text, um, when you study, you realize that it's all seen from a male perspective and women's voices are now joining the conversation as interpreters now, but you know, my youngest son recently was studying the names of the tractates of our oral tradition and he was going through the titles and he said, well, one of them is called Nashim, which translates as women. It's all about marriage. He says, why is it called women if it's about marriage? Why is it not called marriage? And I tried to explain to him it's because all the people talking about it, discussing the laws of marriage, were men, male rabbis, and therefore, when they were talking about marriage, for them it was women stuff. So they called it women. They didn't call it marriage. And it's interesting because you feel very much um, as an outsider when you join that exercise of learning the text. What's happening now with women um, joining advanced learning is that women ask different questions of male rabbis who are the teachers, and rabbis are reacting to women studying the text and approaching the text differently. And they are then influenced, and then when they go back to teach male students, they bring back some of that. So there's quite a change happening, but you can see that where the effect has been of you know, having so many years of a male tradition. So as an Orthodox Jewish woman, I feel I live with a foot in two world, the sacral world where, yes, equality hasn't reached perfection yet, but things are quite, um, have moved on. And then I have a foot in my traditional um, Jewish sphere where sometimes some things feel quite backwards still. Mm -hmm. And Sally, I mean, there's the, some, uh, the, the Dean's story about um, Polly and Sphere and uh, what do I say? The, of course, with this, uh, this uh, feminist theology and there's a whole lot of, I'm just wondering, we're all, all, all here today and we're all experiencing this. How does that sort of play out on the, on the ground as for, for ordinary um, women? I think the concept that God uh, isn't male is quite shocking for a lot of people. Um, even like to hear that actually genuinely from I'm sure from a Christian and Jewish perspective, and I would imagine also in Islam, God is not male. And, and I forget who it was, someone said that if God is male, then male is God. And I think that we have created this concept where, where actually God, men own God. They've become the mediators um, of faith. That sort of if it's only men that are telling you about God and any men who can uh, regulate your access to God, then uh, God is essentially male. God looks like the man in your church or the man in your faith institution. Um, and I think it's really important that we reclaim that access, whether we believe that women can be leaders within their faith traditions or not personally, of course I do, but, but even without that, this concept that God is available through prayer um, in a way that is independent of your male leader, um, what as wonderful as the male leaders might be, that it's so important to know that you are accessing God as she is um, or God, even that's quite shocking, isn't it? I saw a little ripple eyebrows raised throughout the room referring to God as female. But actually, there is a sense that God should be referred to as female as much as male because God is more than either of those terms. And I think there has to be a sense of, of each individual person of faith making the most of their access to God, um, which is independent of male regulators. Um, in order for us to fully understand what it is to be women and actually fully to understand what it is to be men of faith as well and to try and access God as God is rather than as the he or the she that we might have engaged with before. Because in Islam you've got the 99 um, names of, mm. of, of God and I'm just thinking of the, the Hebrew scriptures which um, Jewish friends and, and um, Jews and, and Christians share. We have the image of um, uh, a mother hen, mm. of um, a mother hen with her um, not yes. henlets, what do you call them, chicks, <laughs> um, looking, looking, looking after, very protective and, uh, and obviously a female image of, of God. Um, we, we, we thought that the what can Muslim women teach Christian women was was a little bit kind of <laughs> we didn't feel too comfortable with that. So we um, we we changed it around to what can what can we learn from women of different religious traditions and perhaps sort of pushing that together with the last one. Do women of faith have more in common than they realise? And I would say perhaps women of faith and women of no faith. We're, you know whether we've got a, a religion or not, we've all got values and we all live by um, a, you know, 
according to our worldview or our philosophy or um, our humanism or whatever. So it's none of us are, are sort of value free in that way. So what can we what can we learn from each other, and um, and perhaps do we have more in common as women across all those divides than, than we perhaps realise? But um, back to back to Huda. Yeah, um, I think that as we. Um, Sort of, we are many different female experiences, many different ways in which we express our womanhood, and in coming together and under, coming from a un- place of understanding, and actually coming from a place that we we can accept each other's different stories and our different perspectives. I think those are the, the best things that we can learn from each other. So every day we see examples of women understanding each other, learning from each other, from reg- regardless of whatever faith background is. I think a step forward, and again going back to sort of how I really see my faith as being one that understanding the world as in its differences and through those differences we, we, we learn of God, we learn about his qualities and I say he as in the gender neutral he rather than sort of the, the uh, male um, in Islam is very, I mean God says in sort of surah and qullahu ahad, God is one he's, he is one and um, he, he begets or is not begotten so he's, he's not He's just, you can't think about him in, 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 in human terms. He's just he's transcendental. So, um, yeah, I think those are the, the best things that we can learn from each other. And every time that we see women who are successful and we see women um, who, who challenge, uh, you know, the, the, the stereotypes of each other, um, and, it, and, you know, these are, these are ways that we move forward, hopefully, yeah. Thank you. Well, I think um, I grew up in a very diverse part of London um, I was born and raised a Sikh. I went to a Catholic school. <laughs> My friends were from, you know, vast different communities. So I grew up with a, quite luckily, I think, in a very colour blind kind of way. I accepted people for who they were and how they presented and so on. And so I think when it comes to faith and what you can learn from other faiths, or I think we do that every day that we engage, every day we go into a shop we buy something, when we get on the tube, when we give up our seat to somebody, we're engaging with people and we're learning from our, our own environments that we've been nurtured within to recognise that one isn't defined just by their faith. They are defined by their actions. And I think that, again, allows for us to learn from each other. And I think that's a very, sounds awful, but a humanistic sort of um, thing that we do on a subconscious level without thinking about it. So when it comes to faith, yes, we can learn about the stories and and the the differences in the the religions. And I remember growing up loving the stories out of the Bible because they sounded like this whole new world that I've never heard of. Um, But equally, the Quran and the Torah and, and, you know, all religions have these amazing stories and what they all have in common is that the teachings within them are values they are principles that i'd like to think that we work with and and have today respect um for each other understanding and forgiveness and i think that transcends across all faiths um yeah (laughs) dina So again, I agree, we definitely have more in common that we um, can share. And for me, sometimes it's beyond understanding the differences of the commonality of faith because we're all created in God's image. And I feel that that's the imperative, whether we can understand somebody else's faith. I think we share so much in common. And as women of faith, I think we particularly have challenges that we can sort of um, join our forces to overcome. Um, some of the challenges we have as women of faith is that um, what's sacred and profane mm-hmm. are things that are really categories that are very deeply embedded into people's emotions. Mm-hmm. And people have gut reactions to certain images of women doing certain things that they feel are not allowed or perhaps don't match up with their categories of you know, what's holy and what's profane. And therefore, you can't really convince them in a rational way. And so those are the challenges I see that we can possibly join together and possibly altering. But I also think on the positive side, as women, because we have been other and marginalized for much of our history, we have possibly an understanding, an ability to be more sensitive to the other. And while today in general society, perhaps not in the religious space, but in general society, we have achieved better equality in better terms, not perfect, 
um, we can then be the ones to look out and to alert society to the other invisible. Um, others, those who are disadvantaged and so on, and join forces to really make that the value of feminism. It's not just looking out for us, but it's looking out for anybody else who is disadvantaged. And I think that doesn't mean just because we, we learn from each other and understand uh, Sally in a minute, um, learn from each other and understand one and, and, and um, work together, certainly work together for, for women's rights and all sorts of other things. I mean, say we all have to then become the same. Um, I've changed, you know, in a large extent my ideas that's on during my life and um, I would take that not to be the case. And, uh, it's good to, to re remain different but still to support one another and work together. Sally, and then we'll get to open um, it. One of the things I've, I've learned so much from and in terms of uh, working, uh, leading a multi-faith team uh, that I, uh, in the university I work at, um, is how strong this concept of community is in other faiths. In my own particular tradition, we went through this thing called the Reformation in the, uh, in the 1600s, where um, someone literally hammered their views onto a church door and, and proclaimed that we all should have direct access to God and we should all think about ourselves as individuals within that. And I think there, there's something really important and good within that, but there's also something that we're in danger of losing in this sense of community and otherness and valuing other people within our group and, and seeing ourselves as one part of a whole rather than actually as me and my rights that I will protect at all costs. I think there's something I've learned particularly from uh, the Muslim chaplain I work with um, and actually the Catholic chaplain I work with, Sister Mary, um, as all Catholic chaplains should be called. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but but is, is the sense of community and actually that sub, sub, subjugating my own personal agendas for the good of the whole um, is something that doesn't sit comfortably with me and my assertive Western Christian women's rights issues, but actually the sisterhood that you talked about when you were uh, in studying theology and the, and the sense of, of us all working together for the good of all people, all women and all men and everyone, and, and rather than me and my own personal agenda right now, um, it's something that I particularly am struck by, by in particular non-Western religions, um, and something I, I'd like to grow in more and learn from uh, from other people.